welcome to High Growth with HTDC. I'm your host, Cindy Martsuki. HTDC is the state's tech evangelist, where we support all things tech, innovation, entrepreneurship, and manufacturing. And there's so many very amazing and cool things going on in Hawaii, and this is a place we like to share them with you. So my guest today is David Sicking with the Foreign Trade Zone, director of Foreign Trade Zone 9. Are we the last? Are there just nine foreign trade zones? No, actually, uh, the last count was 177 foreign trade zones. Wow, and we're number nine. We are the number nine in the nation. <laughs> uh, the program started back in 1934, and we got our, our, uh, our number nine status back in 1965. Wow. And so since then, there have been, uh, you know, 160 some before, before it came to us, or before uh, we are where we're at today. Wow. And is that because we're in Hawaii, do you think, that we're one of the earlier? We actually are one of the earlier adopters. I mean, we can get into the story if you'd like to. But, um, <laughs> well, what happened was back in the 1960s, we realized that in order to be a strong state, because we are so far removed from everywhere else in the world, that we really needed uh, energy independence. Yes. And at that point, we had refineries that, that were um, you know, operating here. And we thought, well, if we can get them foreign trade zone status, uh, that will allow them to run, uh, at least operate, at a much more cost-effective rate than they would if they had to just import the, the goods and be able, or the, the crude oil and then be able to refine that uh, and still have to pay the duties and taxes on it prior to actually uh, bringing it into U.S. Uh, territory for consumption. So that's how it started. So that's how it started, With was for energy independence. Remember back then, that's when airplanes couldn't make it from L.A. to, say, Japan. <laughs> they had to stop off in, in oh, yeah, Hawaii, yeah, 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 yeah. and we were also a central area for... Uh, the military as well. Mm -hmm, so mm -hmm. that energy independence was very important to us back then. And so that's where we went to the federal government and asked for our uh, essentially grantee ship to become a foreign trade zone or have the ability to uh, create foreign trade zones within Hawaii. And it's uh, ever since then been history. Wow. Okay, so for those those people out there who don't know, what is the foreign trade zone? What does that mean? Okay, a foreign trade zone is a special area that's on U.S. soil that's considered outside U.S. territory when it comes to customs purposes. So essentially that is an area that is near a port of entry, such as the Port of Honolulu, mm -hmm. that allows for goods to come in, goods and, and uh, whatnot to come in, and be stored or placed within that foreign trade zone indefinitely without the uh, collection of duty and taxes on that. Now, we're talking about the refineries. That was a huge benefit for them because you think of the cost of crude oil and the tariffs that are leveled mm -hmm. on that. Mm -hmm. They can bring that into a foreign trade zone, manufacture, manipulate, whatever they need to do to that oil to create the final end product. And it's at that point when they then deliver it into U.S. territory mm -hmm. for mm -hmm. our consumption that they pay the duties and taxes on it. Mm -hmm. The mm -hmm. other nice part about that is that if they've changed what's called the harmonized tariff of that particular item that's been imported to some different states, so from crude oil into, say, gasoline, mm -hmm. they can actually bring it in at the final rate. So if the final duty rate is less than the original imported good, wow. they can bring it at that rate. So for any company, oh, interesting. you know the old adage, a dollar today is worth more than it is tomorrow. Mm -hmm. If you, can, if you can save that dollar, retain that money, mm -hmm. put it into your facility, into hiring people, into growing your business, as opposed to paying the federal government for it, and have to pay that out later, or in the case of a foreign trade zone and an exported good where you never pay the duties and taxes mm -hmm. on it, uh, for those companies operating in a foreign trade zone, it only makes sense to be able to do that because mm -hmm. that's dollar retention, that's infrastructure building. Mm -hmm. And the part for the United States and, and the way we operate here is that that allows for those companies to create jobs, to create infrastructure, to grow the mm -hmm, economy mm -hmm. around that particular business. So for them, it's it's also a, a big benefit as well, mm -hmm. economic driver. Hmm. Wow. We have um, an infographic maybe that kind of goes over how the foreign trade zone works. Okay. Can we take a look at that? Okay. Uh, this is, yeah, this is kind of a, a maybe a little, little difficult to read, but essentially the way it works is that a foreign good is brought into a foreign trade zone. Now, we talked a little bit about that, the fact that it can be in that foreign trade zone uh, indefinitely. So hmm. let's say I'm an importer of wood flooring, and I want to sell my goods to the local community, mm -hmm. or I have export markets that I want to sell them to. So I can bring my wood in from, say, Brazil. Mm -hmm. 
Now, let's say I'm a manufacturer, and I want to manufacture that wood that I bring in from oh, Brazil into, into flooring. flooring. I can do that in a foreign trade zone. So I bring the, good, the wood in. I don't have to pay the duties and taxes because it's a, an area that's outside U.S. territory. Mm -hmm. Don't have to pay the duties and taxes on it. I can then create my flooring out of that and then declare it at the wood flooring rate, the tariff rate, when I bring it in for our consumption. Hmm. Now, if I decide to actually export that wood, let's say I have uh, people in Canada that want my product mm -hmm. because it's such an exotic, you know, rosewood or whatever type of, of flooring that I design uh, that I, I want to, you know, ship that out to there. Because I'm shipping to a foreign country, it's as if it never entered U.S. Hmm. commerce for, tar for, for uh, tariff purposes. So that means that it gets shipped out to that foreign port. I never have to pay the duties and taxes on wow. it. And I was able to provide jobs and infrastructure for my company. That's interesting. So is it kind of, I'm trying to wrap my head around it, is it anybody's territory? Like, It, it depends on the, the um, use of that foreign trade zone. I see. Um, there are two types of foreign trade zone. One is what's called a general purpose zone. That is like a warehouse. Uh, that's what we do down at our Pier 2 facility is we have a, a public warehouse mm -hmm. where people come in, they can bring those goods in in foreign status, store them there indefinitely, and they only pay by the per cubic foot. So let's say you bring a, a container load of goods into the foreign trade zone and you store them there. Now you're only paying, instead of a full lease space, you're only paying for the cubic foot space that you use. So as you use down that, that item or those items that you brought in, you're only paying for that footprint. So for them, it's a big cost oh, savings. Wow. And yeah. that's, that's what we do at our, our warehouse. The other type is what's called a, a subzone, and that's usually done for manufacturing purposes. Uh, both of our, our refineries here on island is um, our foreign trade zones, okay, yeah, and they yeah. operate that way the same way, where they bring in the crude oil, they refine it into jet fuel hmm. uh, or car fuel or boat bunker fuel. All three of those fuels uh, have a purpose. Uh, like the bunker fuel, but if a ship comes in from China and needs to be refueled before it heads back out, that's considered a foreign trade zone transfer, so the duties and taxes aren't wow. paid on it. If it's brought in for us to put in our automobiles, they pay the duties and taxes at the time it enters in for U.S. Mm -hmm. commerce mm -hmm. uh, use. Uh, if it's going on a jet from, let's say, Japan that came in to drop off wow. tourists or to bring in business oh, people for, for work, um, that then is again an, an export, so therefore they never pay the duties and taxes on it. So those companies are actually realizing a gain or a benefit in terms of uh, you know, being able to use a foreign trade zone and mm -hmm. the economy is actually seeing a benefit because those jobs are provided mm -hmm. uh, because they're because able they to, to operate the as cash. such as a foreign trade and zone. And all those transactions have to take place within the Within the, the foreign trade system. zone, right, right. It's at the moment that you do declare that to customs that you then have to pay the duties and taxes. Ah. And what are, what are some of the challenges that the, our foreign trade zone faces? The biggest challenge um, is really establishing a foreign trade zone. Now, hmm. we, uh, we as uh, foreign trade zone number nine hold two capacities. One, we're what's called the grantee. So we went to the federal government back in 1965, and we said we'd like to become a foreign trade zone for the state of Hawaii. And just so you know, we said there were 177 foreign trade zones throughout the nation. Mm -hmm. um, that means that there is one in, at least one foreign trade zone grantee in every single state of the mm -hmm. union, uh, including three in Puerto Rico. So there's a fair wide breadth of, yeah. of foreign trade zones throughout. Since Hawaii is not a huge state, there's really only one foreign trade zone here, and that's foreign trade zone number nine. Uh, and we pretty much do handle uh, you know, all of the, the Hawaiian islands in terms of our grantee. So we're the grantee. We oversee the program, so we help to establish and grow the program with, within the state of Hawaii. Mm -hmm. We're also an operator, and that's our Pier 2 facility. So we allow, as a public facility or as a public-like utility, for the, the general, comp the general mm -hmm. um, community to be able to bring goods or import goods into that foreign trade zone. Mm -hmm. um, we also are the export point for many uh, goods or ship services as well. So even if there are domestic products that are made, let's say there are cans of beer that Budweiser has made, and they're going to be putting that onto a foreign vessel, like a, a fishing vessel mm -hmm. uh, that's foreign flag. Um, they can bring it into a foreign trade zone, and at that moment, they change the declaration of that particular item from being a domestic product to being a foreign export product. So any component parts that went into making that, like let's say they bought the steel from China in order to make the cans, mm -hmm. that then they can do what's called a duty drawback and ask for those goods or the, that um, Oh, the, the money back on that they actually paid that they for had paid when they brought it in. Right, right. Wow. So there's, there's two parts of really what we do. So we're not only the grantee, but we're also an operator. So we try to establish other operators throughout the state. Uh, one of our other uh, foreign trade zones uh, hmm. is Pacific Allied Products. 
They're the ones that make the recyclable plastic yeah, bottles. Yeah, yeah. They have the uh, all the, the product for Coke and Sunny on island. And what's nice about that is that Coke doesn't have to ship the product from the mainland all the way here. They essentially take it, uh, bring the, the rest, secret recipe here, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and uh, um, uh, Pacific Allied Products actually does the bottling mm -hmm. and uh, or the you know the bottle production and the fulfillment for them. And it's a huge cost savings for Coke because they don't have to ship. Mm -hmm. you, know, you know, when you ship something, it's all about about the space that you take up mm -hmm. and the weight that you the take weight. up. And that's way reduced because you're talking about a product like, like a liquid that has a lot yeah. of weight to it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So really our challenge is, is trying to establish those throughout. And because uh, we have to go to the Foreign Trade Zones Board in Washington, D.C. to be oh. able to establish that, there's a lot of paperwork, federal paperwork <laughs> that needs to be done. Uh, and there has to be some economic benefit that we show for a company becoming foreign trade zone and what that economic benefit or driver is going to be and where that export or that import savings component is in that particular wow. economic uh, you know, development uh, project. So where Pacific Allied is, like mm -hmm. their whole property, is that considered a foreign trade zone? Well, it, there's two parts of being a foreign trade zone. One is actually establishing the land mm -hmm. for being a foreign trade zone. The other is actually activating a foreign trade zone within that established land. Now, all of James Campbell Industrial Park is considered a foreign trade zone. Wow. So back in, I think, the 70s, we went out there and said, okay, huh. we'd like this whole park area to be a foreign trade zone. So we established the land out there mm -hmm. as a foreign trade zone. I see. We have about 14 sites, um, I think, on all the islands except for Lanai and, and um, Lanai, Molokai, and Kauai that have foreign trade zone designated land on it. I we see, have space in Hilo. We have space in Kona. We have space uh, in... Um, uh, Maui, uh, so you know all these spaces, and then all of James Campbell Industrial Park. We have hmm. Lani Tech Park, our foreign trade hmm. zone. So these have all been already established. Uh -huh. Now it's a matter of getting companies either to that magnet site uh -huh. as a foreign trade zone, or finding other other companies that are within the area that we need to first establish the land as a foreign trade zone, and then activate and them as services. a foreign trade zone. Oh. And there's a lot of customs when you go to activate a lot of customs intervention because they say, okay, we need a lot of security because these are goods mm -hmm. that haven't cleared customs. So we need I to make see. sure that there isn't anything that's filtering that's out into into huh. our um, public consumption area. Otherwise, it's considered smuggling and there's a lot of federal penalties <laughs> that go along with that. So we have to be very, very um, prudential about how we go about establishing foreign trade zones. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, interesting. Okay, we're going to take a quick break and then we'll be right back. This is High Growth with HTBC, and my guest today is David Sicky, director of FTZ9. We're on Think Tech Hawaii, and we'll be right back. I'm Hong Jiang, host for Asia In Review on Tuesdays. And I'm David Day, host for Asian Review on Thursdays. Both of us broadcast our respective shows at 4 p.m. And my topics tend to deal with uh, questions related to the environment, culture, history, and sometimes human rights. And my shows tend to be on international business, foreign policy, geopolitics, and national security. And you can watch our shows live on the ThinkTech website at thinktechhawaii.com. And uh, you can also watch us on YouTube or Olalo. So come join us on Thursdays at 4 p.m. I'm David Day. And Hi. on Tuesdays at 4 p.m., I'm Hong Jiang. Aloha. Aloha. with HTBC, and I'm your host, Cindy Matsuki. I wanted to let you know what's going on around town. A lot of things are happening this Friday, October 10th. HTDC is partnering up with the Hawaii Small Business Development Center, HSBDC, to introduce the Business Model Canvas to entrepreneurs and financial professionals. The Business Model Canvas is a centerpiece tool used in the Lean Startup methodology that can help quickly assess a company's potential for success. To register, please visit htdc.org. Also, UH College of Engineering is having their annual fall career on Wednesday, October 15th from 1 to 4 p.m. at Holmes Hall. They usually get a great turnout of about 60 or so Hawaii companies looking to hire engineers, so that's one to check out. Also on the 15th at Zenworks from 6.30 to 8.30 p.m. is a free workshop hosted by the Founder Institute Startup Pitch Bootcamp with Brian Nelson, co-founder and chairman of BNC. Pitching is a key skill of every successful entrepreneur. You'll learn how to communicate your business clearly to employees, customers, and investors. So check that one out on the 15th as well. 
For businesses and entrepreneurs who need some quick legal advice, every Wednesday, HTDC offers free legal guidance in partnership with the Business Law Corps. You can sign up for a 30-minute appointment at the Manoa Innovation Center. Please visit htdc.org legal to sign up. On a short note, I wanted to let our entrepreneur community know that we have office space available at the Manoa Innovation Center. We offer a collaborative community, co-work spaces, office services, and great programs for starting your business. For more information, please visit us again at htdc.org. Lastly, calling all SBIR Phase 1 winners. If you've won an SBIR Phase 1 recently, HTDC offers the state's matching funds for up to 50% of your Phase 1 award. If that's you, please get in touch with us as soon as you can at sbir at htdc.org. And now, back to our guest, David Sicking, Director of Foreign Trade Zone 9. Um, I wanted to ask you, since you've been, how long have you been there? Uh, I've been with the Foreign Trade Zone since 2008, and I've been okay. the administrator of the Foreign Trade Zone since uh, 2011. Okay. About three years as the administrator. Very good. So you've been there um, for a while. What kind mm -hmm. of trends do you see as far as Hawaii's import export? You know, it's kind of funny because when when you look at what comes and goes out of the Foreign Trade Zone, mm -hmm. you kind of get a pulse as to how the economy is doing, mm. um, and. And we usually see some of the trends long before you might see it in the regular economy, where uh, mm -hmm. certain certain businesses start to slow down on their import goods, or certain items that were very uh, greatly exported mm -hmm. begin to slow down. In other words, they're not. So I think it's like a leading indicator. So it's kind of a leading indicator yeah. as to how how uh, Hawaii's economy is doing, mm. um, and it, it's always changing. Um, you know, you you for several years ago there were more hard goods that were coming in, uh, you know, hard good products. Now we're seeing things switch more toward the alternate energy. Uh, we see a lot of photovoltaic mm -hmm. panels mm -hmm. coming in. A lot more alternate energy companies are coming and knocking on our doors, saying, "Hey, you know, what can you do to help us out?" Because now those tariffs on those particular items are starting mm -hmm. to go up. That's true. And so uh, again, if it's a if it's a, you know tariff relief that you're looking for, or something that you can do in order to you know retain cash in your business, again, that's that's what we're about when it comes to uh, you know importing importing mm -hmm. uh, component parts or even goods for uh, resale. Mm -hmm. Ah. So we're looking good, you think? We're so far <laughs> doing okay. Um, you know, probably within the last six months, we've seen things kind of level out a little bit. Okay. Uh, so, you know, in terms of really moving ahead with the economy, uh, you know, that, that's hard to say. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I don't see anything really slipping right now. We're holding, okay. holding pat, which is really a good sign, especially going now into the holiday season. Mm -hmm. It's kind of hard to say that, but, you know, as we're in October, that's when our customers begin to really ramp up uh, their, their goods coming in because they're getting geared up for the holiday season. So for us, it, uh, uh, you know, we're, we're still seeing a, a fairly good, uh, fairly, you know, mm -hmm. far or high amount of uh, goods coming in. Oh, good. Yeah. And just in time, because you have some news, right? You're expanding. Right, right. That's really the, the big exciting news that we have here at the Foreign Trade Zone. Um, we are in the process, or have been. I mean, it started nine years ago with somebody's idea. I think nine years ago. Had, yeah, with, with the uh, administrator <laughs> back then, Mark Anderson, uh, who's now uh, oh, yeah. with the state system. He's <laughs> moved in. Um, he, he got the idea to start doing some um, some upgrades or some changes to the foreign trades mm -hmm. and to make it more relevant, to keep it relevant within the, uh, the local economy, and to really be proactive in terms of how we approach, uh, you know, our position as uh, an economic development organization in the state of Hawaii. And uh, if you don't know, we mm -hmm. are a division of DBED. We're a sister agency to HDDC. Mm -hmm. uh, we lean heavily on them when it comes to the, the, <laughs> the incubator end of things because, like I said, we're a program that was designed to be more of an in infrastructure building. Mm -hmm. And we're now starting to meld into something that is more in terms of incubation or, or growth at the, at yeah, the mid or building. low level. So company building. Mm -hmm. And that's something we really haven't done in the past. So one of the ideas behind that was to start or grow additional space within our facility to be able to host more companies. Mm -hmm. The idea, uh, and these, this is the re way that really um, economic development is going uh, as we move forward in the future, is to create those clusters of area where you get those similar or like companies, much like Silicon Valley, mm -hmm. where you get all these companies that come together that have to start to feed off of each other, mm. whether they're competitors or support companies or other companies that feed into that whole system. 
So that's, that was the idea, and we started that, that particular end of things about seven or eight years ago, which really great, bringing in the logistics idea. people, bringing in the customs brokers, bringing in the shipping agents. Uh, so we start to have that all within our facility, and that model really proved to be very mm. beneficial to mm -hmm, our customers, mm -hmm. our tenants. So what we did is we said, okay, let's look for more area that we can grow out, because we are at 100% capacity at our facility right now. Uh -huh. We can't host any more people. How do, we, how do we then grow the economy if we really can't get, in, get any deeper into uh -huh. what we're doing? Well, we decided, okay, we've got another portion of our facility. It was designed for office space when the building was built back in the 1950s. Uh -huh. So what can we do to renovate that out and to create more office space? Well, three years ago, or actually four years ago, we went to the uh, U.S. Uh, Economic Development Administration and said, we'd like to get a grant, some, some money to help offset this particular initiative that we have. Mm -hmm. uh, they said, okay. We went in for a competitive grant and, we're, and won a $3 million grant to be able to move forward okay. with this. We got additional state funding to be able to match that, and actually we exceeded that a little bit in terms of what we're doing. So now we've created a $10.5 million renovation project wow. that is adding 40 additional offices, co-working space and um, conference space as well. That's great. So we're coming down to the end of the project. Uh, if all goes as planned, we should be ready for business about November 15th or so. Mm -hmm. We do have a couple things we're trying to you know, clean out at the end here, but uh, we'd probably be able to start getting tenants in about December 1st, somewhere between November 15th and December 1st. So we're really excited by that. This uh, yeah. the project and the build has been about a year, year and a half. That's great. So we're very excited by it. That's great. And what kind of companies do you think could benefit most? Those companies that do import-export, mm -hmm. especially, even if you're a small startup company, you'd like to start maybe importing something from Japan, or you have an idea that you huh. want to start importing goods from China or Southeast Asia or the Philippines. Um, again, if, if there's tariffs on that or, mm -hmm. or items that you'd end up paying the duties on when it comes right into the port, that may be a way to offset your costs, especially mm -hmm. for a young company. Uh, now that we're going to be offering innovation space to be able to help develop smaller companies, that's a great place for you to come and be able to develop your, your business, your business model, without having to you know, mm, put out yep, a lot of money for office space or incur those additional costs that you have. So that's really exciting. That um, is. And, and you know, again, we're opening those up. We have about a 55% fill rate right now, so we're looking for additional companies. We have offices anywhere from about 200 to I think the, the largest one is about 650 square feet right now. Great. We charge on a per square foot basis, um, and it's a flat fee, and then there is additional charges for electricity. So there's like a 15 cent per square foot uh, uh, charge for electricity mm -hmm. or meter, whichever is greater. So again, it's a really cost-effective way for you to be able to develop your business. That's we great. talked about the shared business, and that's really where we're, you know, the shared office space. That's where we're really leading on HDDC, is to be able to help us develop that model that will mm -hmm. help small companies be able to get in, use shared office space, and develop their company, and hopefully be able to grow into one of the large offices we mm -hmm. have and begin to import and export through our facility. We really see exports as a as a um, underutilized mm -hmm. form of our economy out there. And mm -hmm. really, if you want a growing economy, exports are really the key. And so we're doing everything mm -hmm. we can to find those companies that help support export, help support That's import great. and export, and grow that sector of our economy. That's great. I think, and especially Hawaii has a great brand. So absolutely, something we got to cash in on. <laughs> right, right. Um, and if people want more information, there's several China. places you can go. Um, you can go to our website. It's uh, H HTTP, as you know, www.f as in Frank, T as in Tango, Z as in Zephyr, the number 9.org. You can follow us on Twitter. We're at FTZ9. Uh, you can also find us on LinkedIn and on Facebook as well. Or you can look us up uh, on the web uh, and be able to call us directly. We'll be able to give you uh, any information you'd like. If you'd like the information on the office space or how we operate in our uh, foreign trade zone warehouse, or if you're looking to establish a foreign trade zone, say in James Campbell Industrial Park or other parts of the, the state, we certainly will uh, see what we can do to help establish that for you as well. Great. Thank you so much for being here. My pleasure. And letting us know. So thank you for having me. So if you're looking for some space, get in touch with David. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and thank you, everybody, for supporting our entrepreneur and manufacturing community out there. Thanks for watching. This is High Growth with HTDC on Think Tech Hawaii. And we've been speaking with David Sicking. FTZ9. We'll see you next time. Thank you.